All right, so we're continuing on the epistle of James, chapter 4. James, the half-brother of Jesus. And I hope you're enjoying as we go through this book in more depth. And what I've always found in my life is uh, when you sit through expository preaching of a book, uh, the next time you read through it, it it, uh, is is, uh, much more clear to you as you read through it. So it also helps that. But I'm, I'm enjoying it too, because even though this book is quite familiar to me, um, when I preach through the books uh, in an expository way, it kind of forces me to try and understand the verses that I don't <laughs> get so well. I don't always understand all of them, but um, there are some that I, I, I get that I've, I've always read and I, I don't think I fully understood, but I'm not saying I fully understand them now, but this is what I think it means as I'm doing it with my own study. One thing I find as well, like, you know, when, when, I, when I first read through or when I think about the the, the chapter of James, you don't really see, you know, sometimes when you read through a chapter, you don't really see like a common theme that's running through that chapter. Uh, and I think I've noticed a common theme now as I've studied this chapter and the theme going through this chapter, I believe, is this idea that he mentions is being exalted and being humbled, right? Right? So, you know, exalting yourself or humbling yourself versus God exalting you or God humbling you. And um, I think we'll see that there. So the headings that I've sort of given for the different section kind of allude to this theme. But we'll see here first in James 4, talks about these wars and fightings. And I think what's, what's relevant to the wars and fightings is people exalting themselves in the war in the world because of their lust, right? So their lust for power, their lust for material wealth, and this is why there's wars and fightings to exert power over another person. Um, Countries do it, individuals do it. You know, wars don't only happen between countries. Sometimes they happen between, you know, businesses in the back end. I mean, that's pretty much what a mafia is. Mafia is just like, you know, a business out in the front, you know, doing things wrong, and businesses probably do it in the background as well, where people get assassinated or, you know, politically assassinated or whatnot. Um, but these wars and fightings that come. So James 4 alludes to this. He says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? So the lusts of the world lead to wars and violence. And like I said, it's not just about countries going to war when you think of wars and fighting. You know, there's gangs as well. You know, often they'll say, you know, when you watch those mafia movies, it's like, are you ready for another war? They talk about these wars between gangs and rival families. And yeah, that's probably happening, you know, and there's nothing new under the sun that it's probably happening there as well. It's why, our, you know, families fighting with each other and killing each other and beating each other up. I'm sure that's happening there. And he says, where does it come from? Well, it's a desire to have things and, you know, it's exalting yourself. And this is why I think there's this common theme throughout James 4 is that's one way people lift themselves up is that they go to war to actually get material possessions to lift themselves up, make themselves more rich. So like I said, gangs. And, you know, same with countries. You know, countries will often posture themselves to say, oh, you know, we're going, we're invading this country to protect your freedoms. You know, and you think like, how does 20, 30 bases in another country protect my freedom? I don't know. All that money spent, you know, invading other countries and doing all this. And... You know, a lot of people think that, you know, the, the main reason for a lot of these wars is about resources. You know, it's about, you know, America, you know, controlling their power to be the reserve currency of the world, or they're going into Iran or Iraq because there's oil stores there, gold, or whatever. But, you know, a lot of these wars will likely be caused by lusts, that war in your members, right? So that's one way people exalt themselves. It reminds me of this verse, 1 Timothy 6. But they that will be rich, so what does that mean? People that desire wealth, right? They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, so there's this this lust here, so it's not the money that's the problem, right? It's the love of money, is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through 
with many sorrows. So not only do you do a lot of damage to yourself, but a lot of damage is done to other people as well because of the love of money. But look, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Right? So we see here the love of money is the root of all evil. So, and like I said, not only countries, but also gangs and businesses. Let's continue. James 4, verse 2. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So he kind of pivots here about, like, you know, people desiring to have things. And then he pivots here to saying, well, you know, you, you don't receive things. Maybe you don't always have the things you want because you ask not. But then he says here in verse 3, ye ask not <coughs> and receive not. <laughs> Because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So he talks about, hey, sometimes when you, you need something, you can ask for it. You don't always have what you need because you don't ask for it. But then verse 3 he's saying, but you can ask for things in the right way and in the wrong way. Right? So it's, so it's not everything you ask for of God you get. There are things to ask for that are right and there are things, and the way to ask that are wrong. You ask and you receive not, why are they not getting it? Why? Because you ask amiss, you're asking the wrong intentions, the wrong way, that you may consume it upon your lust. It's like, why are you asking for these things from God? Is it just to fulfill the desires that you have for material possession? A lot of people do that. You know, God, I need this promotion. God, bless my business. But why? You know, is it just to consume it upon your lust? Maybe that's why you're not getting it because you've got the wrong heart behind it. So people often use verses where Jesus talks about, well, if you ask for anything, you'll receive it, and they all sound good, but that's not the full picture. The full picture is what are you asking for? Right? Why are you asking for it? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. So having the faith to ask without doubting, like we read in James chapter 1, when we ask in faith, nothing, nothing wavering, that's already hard enough. But, you know, he's saying here, if you ask for anything in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. But what's the caveat, right? James, we have a caveat. Hey, you ask amiss and receive not, because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Well, let's look at 1 John 5. It says here in verse 14, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So that's a question you've got to ask yourself. Is if you really want this thing from God, is this something that is according to God's will? Because that's the prayer that God may answer, right? And you're not asking amiss. Okay, let's go on to verse number 4, James 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So there's a few things in this passage, and um, you know, we'll be going to that verse about the lusts of the world. But first of all, the adulterers and adulteresses. So what does, why, if you are materialistic and covetous, and he's talking about whence come wars and fightings among you, the lusts that war in your members. That's why you're willing to kill and dominate other people and aggress on other people is to, to obtain these material possessions. Why is, why is he saying ye adulterers and adulteresses? What does that got to do with adultery? Well, let me explain, right? Colossians 3, 5. Look at this verse here. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and look at this, covetousness, which is idolatry, right? So you see how covetousness, you know, I guess the love of money, materialistic, being materialistic, that is idolatry. So then why does he say here, ye adulterers and adulteresses? Because idolatry is, uh, idolatry is spiritual adultery to God, right? And this is why when he talks about in the Old Testament, Israel and Judah and, you know, they're committing adultery, Right? But what are they doing? They're committing idolatry. They had their groves. They had their, you know, their, their idols that they built. Look at what he says here in Jeremiah 3. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. 
Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So you see how God is talking about nations here, right? Committing adultery against it. But how do they commit adultery? And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks, right? So this is not people sleeping with stones and with stocks. It's the idolatry with graven images, right? And, um, you know, stocks that they're carving into images and committing idolatry, and that's spiritual adultery. So you say, you know, well, Victor, you know, I, you know, I would never, you know, some, I mean, some Christians do have a bit of idolatry in their life, <laughs> you know. I mean, uh, you know, they're, they're, they may have the rosary bead, they may have, you know, lucky charms, you know, things like that. I mean, these are ways that people, you know, sort of attribute things uh, that God has to, to things, right? But let's say, you know, you're, you're a Christian and you say, you know what, I, I would never carve, you know, carve out a statue, bow down to a statue. And you say, that's just an abomination. You know, I'd never do that to God. Yeah, but do you hold material things above God? You know, what do you think about more? What do you, what do you, you know, and, and maybe not think about like, what do you think is God? Right? Because it's not just about what do you think God is. You say, well, obviously I, don't, I know that God is not this statue. But, but where is your love and devotion? What, what is your life committed to? You know, when you wake up in the morning, what do you live for? What do you wake up in the morning for every day? And if it's just to be comfortable in this world, to live life and to make money, you know, well, you are holding up an idol of mammon in your life, right? And that's... The Bible saying here in Colossians 3, look, covetousness, which is idolatry. So when people are materialistic and they live for money and they have the love of money in their life, that is the same as committing idolatry, right? So this is why adulterers and adulteresses, right? Covetousness, which is idolatry, and idolatry is, you know, spiritual adultery, right? The adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So the friendship of the world, so when we talk about the world, we're not talking about just physical things. Because sometimes people say like, oh, you know, you know uh, like people will scoff sometimes when, when preachers talk about worldliness. And they'll say, like, oh, well, yeah, well, you use the internet, you know, you have like technology you know, like worldly things. Like we're not talking about physical things when we talk about the world. The Bible is very clear what it means by things of the world. And the definition here is in 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So as you see, there's a very similar concept there, right? That if you're a friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. If you love the world, you don't have the love of the Father in you. There's no middle ground there. For all that is in the world... The lust, so this is, this is the definition of worldliness here. The lusts of the flesh. So again, remember how we talked about here exalting yourself through lust? So you can see here that it's all kind of linked, right? When he talks about the friend of the world, it's all going back to lust. For all that is in the world, the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. <coughs> so it's things that are good to, good to the flesh to look at, right? The lusts of the lust of the Sorry, the lust of the flesh are things that make you feel good. The lust of the eyes are the things that look good. And the pride of life, the things that lift you up, that exalt you. Right? These are the, what the world is talking about. It's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lusts thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we go back to James 4. So he says here, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. You see, you have the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. Right? So if you think of lust of the flesh, I mean, a good example is like, you know, drugs. Right? Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. Good example of that. Pornography. Right? And uh, the pride of life. You know, it's like lifting yourself up, boast, being boastful, and things like that. You know, doing things to, to, to build up your own reputation and your own your own ego, as opposed to um, trying to lift others up. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So we see here that dichotomy, right, where it's one or the other. 
We saw that in 1 John 2, where he said, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Right? And we see this in Matthew 12 as well. Look, he that is not with me, this is Jesus, is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So what you need to understand in life is that there's no middle ground. Right? If you're not gathering with Jesus, you're scattering. Right? There's, you need to make sure that you're doing one or the other. There is no neutral. Right? You can't say, well, this, this thing, you know, where I'm sitting right now is neutral. I'm not affecting either. No, because you're either one or the other. She says, you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Look, you cannot serve God and mammon. All right, so there's that idea there. Now, I wanted to just lastly just go to this parable here in Luke 14. Luke 14, verse 7. This is the parable of you know, people choosing out the chief rooms. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. When he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honourable man than thou be bidden of him. So, right? so it's like you're invited to a feast and you want the best seats. Right? So you can see how this is tied in to materialism right? and wanting what's best physically, right? the chief seats. And he that bade thee and him come, and he, and he that bade thee, so, so the one that invited you, he comes and say to thee, give this man place. So now he's like, you've chosen out the chief rooms, and now he's saying, hey, well, he's lifting actually somebody up and saying, hey, you're actually in somebody else's seat. And thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. Right? So now you try to exalt yourself, choosing out the chief rooms, and now the master of the party is now humbling you as they exalt somebody else. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. So worship is not only, only, doesn't only mean um, like worshipping somebody like a god, right? It just means being lifted up. So this is why we give worship to God, because we are lifting him up. In the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So we see that concept there in James. And this is why I think this parable sort of aligns with that, where, you know, this parable is alluding to that lust, where people are exalting themselves by lust. Right? All right, so let's continue. So that's the first section of James. Exalt, exalting by lust. We see the wars and the fightings. And then we see also the friendship of the world, which is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let's go on. So now the next section is the, uh, now the opposite. Rather than lifting yourself up, and, and it mainly focuses on the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, now he goes on about humbling yourselves. So verse, verse 5. Now, this verse has often perplexed a lot of people. I was reading up about it on the internet because when, you say, when it says here, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us <coughs> lusteth to envy? And the reason why it's perplexed a lot of people is because this verse is not actually, this, this statement is not actually a verse in the Bible. So when people say, well, James is saying that the scripture says the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but how come we can't find this scripture? And you know, why, why does the spirit in us lust at the envy if the spirit is our born-again spirit, right? It's talking to Christians and whatnot. Um, so it could be some people think that it's talking about man's spirit. Some people think that, you know, James is not necessarily quoting a direct scripture, but he's just giving an idea that the scripture gives, right? Which is this idea that man is materialistic and has a, a desire for things naturally. What, what I think this is actually saying is he's, he's kind of... It's like if I was to put it another way, is he, is he saying, do you think the Bible teaches a vain teaching, which is that it's actually a godly thing for you to be materialistic? That's what I think he's saying here. He's saying, do you think, it's like, it's like he's saying, like, oh, you know, you want all these things, you want all these possessions, you want to be a friend of the world, and it's like, is that what you think the Bible teaches? Do you think the Bible teaches you to be materialistic? You know, to desire, all these, like the prosperity gospel. It's always like that. It's like, it's like, is that what you think God wants for you? To, to desire all these material things and have the love of money and that's godly? You know, that the spirit dwells in you, lusts at the envy? So that's why I think he's saying, do you think that the scripture saith in vain? 
It's like he's giving us this vain commandment to desire worldly things. So obviously the answer to that is no, right? So that's what I think he's saying here in this verse. I don't think he's actually quoting a scripture. I think he's giving us that thought. Because then the contrast is in verse 6. But he giveth more. This is what what the Bible actually says. This is the true thing that God wants and what our spirit truly desires as born-again believers. He giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. This is the actual teaching of Scripture, that he will resist you if you try and exalt yourself, but he gives more grace to you if you humble yourself. And this verse is actually a quote from Proverbs 3, 34. Surely he scorneth the scorners, (coughs) but he giveth grace unto the lowly, right? So we see this concept as well in other parts of the Bible because this, this verse of humbling yourselves and being lifted up is also uh, here in 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. So you see the same theme of you humble yourselves, you submit yourself, yea, All of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So that's that same quote in James. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So I was telling this to the kids this morning, but one great way to remember this and to be reminded is, see, your job is to humble yourself right, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up or that he may exalt you in due time. So it's God's job to lift you up. So you can see there that the theme throughout James 4 is ways people lift themselves up, right, the wars and the fightings, material possessions, the friend of the world, the lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's why we were talking about in the first section, exalting yourself by lust. But your job is to actually humble yourself, Right? Submit to the commands of God. Consider as others more than yourselves. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to, like the Bible says. And God's job then is to exalt you in due time. So like that parable of the chief rooms, the master of the, the feast is actually God exalting somebody. Right? And the people that exalted themselves in this world, they're going to be told, no, wait, you actually, your seat is down there. So there's a ber- great balancing that's going to happen at Judgment Day. Right? So your job is to humble yourself. God's job is to exalt you. So the joke is, or what people say to remind you of this, is make sure you're doing your job and God will do his. But if you start doing God's job, God will start doing yours. (laughs) Right? So I always remember that. It's a great way to remember it. And uh, it's a good reminder to, hey, make sure we focus on humbling ourselves, that God exalts us. Because if we focus on exalting ourselves, God's going to come and humble us, right? James 4, verse 7. Let's continue. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So what does it mean to humble yourself? What does it mean to submit yourself to God? Right? It's to do his will instead of yours. Right? So this is not just some nebulous thing where you say, oh, submissive, like God's going to work through me. The way that that works is, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you love God, you keep his commandments. If you submit to God, you obey God. That's why when wives submit to their husbands, what does that mean? Right? It means you respect them. It means you obey them. Right? You're doing their will, not yours. That's what it means to submit. So when we submit ourselves to God, we are doing God's will, not our will. How do we know what God's will is? You know, Elizabeth was telling me this last night. I was having this thought where she goes, like, you know, somebody asked in the forum, it's like, oh, well, how, how do you know what God's will is? Like, how do you know, like, what God wants for you? And, and then some of the parents in the homeschooling group is like, well, you just, you just pray really hard and it's like a, it's like a quiet voice. So you, you have to, to feel something. And look, you know, I'm not saying that it's impossible for God to do that, but that's a very, you know, uh, what's the word? Like a subjective way to know what God's will is. You know, the best way to know what God's will is is that the Bible... See, the Bible is telling us what God's will is. You know, often in the Bible, it's, it's not about how to know God's will, right? Because we know God's will because God has revealed his will. The hard thing is how to do God's will, how to submit to God's will. 
how to say, not what I will, but as thou will, as Jesus prayed in the garden. So it's not what I want, it's what the Bible says, the way I should live, right? Luke twenty two forty one. 41, this is what Jesus, his example, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I think it's very important for us to know that, you know, that Christianity is like that. You know, when we say, like, how do we know God's commandments? God's word. You know, how do, how do, we, how do we get God to speak to us? Well, it's through his word. Right? It's not something subjective or nebulous that you don't really know because, you know, the danger of, you know, it, it, it's almost a bit like the Mormons, you know? They just pray really hard, pray really hard, and you get the burning in the bosom. It's almost like Christi Christians have turned Christianity into that as well. And the danger there is they make Christianity, they, they, they call that being spiritual, but what I find it is, it's just very emotionally driven, right? Because there's no way you, for you to judge whether that feeling or whether that thing you heard is of God, right? And if it is, how do you know? Well, you know because of God's word, right? So ultimately, it comes down to God's word. God's word is what's going to give you assurance. It's going to give you surety. It's like that anchor where you know. See, I don't have to wonder, was it God, right? When I read the Bible, I know that's God speaking to me. And if we have that assurance, that's a much more of a better, solid sort of guidance for our life, right? 1 Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So why am I going to 1 Peter 5? It says here, resist yourselves therefore to God. Uh, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. All right, so it's, it's good to know that if we, res how do we resist the devil? Right? So it's not just about you know, just having the willpower. You resist the devil by submitting yourselves to God. Right? So that's how you resist the devil. You submit yourself to God. You keep God's commandments, God's will, not your will. That's how you resist the devil. And we have the assurance here that he will flee from you. So isn't that interesting? So I mean, when the Bible uses the word flee, it's almost like he's worried. I mean, when you flee from something, it's almost like you're scared. You're worried about that person. And the Bible's saying here that if we submit ourselves to God, I mean, that's resisting the devil, and he actually is worried about us. He will flee from us. You know, because the, the devil doesn't come after those that he knows are unshakable. You know, the, str the stronger you are in your faith, the more the devil's going to leave you alone. Why, why does he bother? Right? And this is why I'm going here to 1 Peter 5. Be sober, be vigilant. Right? So this is about resisting the devil, you know, submitting to God. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about looking, seeking whom he may devour. And we see that also in the animal kingdom, right? When lions and tigers, they go after a pack of animals, who do they go for? They go for the weak. They go for the young. They go for the ones that are straying away from the herd. They're the ones they go after. And it's that analogy that God is giving us to say, hey, spiritually, you don't want to be that young, weak one on the border, right? Because they're the ones that are going to be taken up by this adversary, the devil, who's walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So there's a different angle here that one, we resist steadfast, like we submit ourselves to God, we keep his commandments, right? But we are also encouraged that when we try and resist the devil and submit to God, that we're not alone in this battle, right? Others have the same struggles, right? And that can be an encouragement to us. All right, let's go on to verse 8. James 4, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. So this is like a, a promise that God will respond to your desire to want to be close to him. You know, sometimes people in the Christian life, you know, maybe you're a bit backslidden, maybe you're not living the way, you know, in your conscience, you're like, you know, I'm not living right with God. I mean, you know, we've all been there. We all have ups and downs in our Christian life. And, you know, sometimes you get the wrong idea that when you are not living, right, or you're in sin, maybe you've gone back to a sin that you, you know, you overcame previously, but you've fallen back into it, that you say, well, God doesn't want anything to do with me. You know, God does not, you know, God's done with me. And even if I draw nigh to God, God doesn't want anything to do with me. And I think this is a verse as a reminder that, no, no, if you draw nigh to God, 
He says, He will draw nigh to you. Right? So, you know, you come to God. God will always receive. He's like the, he's like the father. Remember in that parable of the prodigal son? The son went away and then he came back to his father. I mean, he was thinking, you know, would his father accept him? Well, he came back and his father opened, you know, uh, welcomed him back with open arms. So I think that's a good, th- good reminder for us because sometimes when you're in a dark place, you have these thoughts and they're not true. Right? You have these thoughts that God is done with you, that God hates you, God doesn't love you anymore. But you need to be reminded from God's word. No, no, you draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. So how do you do that? So we talked about submitting to God. How do you draw nigh to God? Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Right? It's about getting your heart and your body right with God. Right? So, so there's sins against the body, you know, like drugs and things like that, but fornication as well is a sin against the body. Getting your heart right with God. Right? You're having, you know, one way your heart might be not right with God. We talked about covetousness, didn't we? Right? Not having God at first in your life. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Right? So what has that got to do with purifying your hearts, cleansing your hands? Why? Because when you go through hard times, when you, when you focus on sometimes negative things in life, it gives you the right perspective. Right? Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Why is that a bad thing? Because sometimes when, when we have suffering in our life, when we have trials and temptations, you, you, you remember what life should really be about. It's like when I talked about, you know, like when, remember when we were going through the lockdowns, things are going hard, people getting their freedoms taken away, what happens? You start to pray a bit more. Start to go to church a bit more. Maybe you picked up your Bible for the first time when all that was going through, you know? And this is what I mean. Sometimes you need a bit of hard times to give you the right perspective. This is why, look at what it says in Ecclesiastes 7. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. And the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of of mirth, right? So when you focus on, sometimes when you think about it, our life will be over one day, you have the right perspective, right? And you live life the right way, knowing that life is short. And you'll see that that's a common thing. Even later on in James, we see that about life is short. James 4, verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. So the correct way to be exalted, you know, I preached a sermon once, you can go back and listen to it, you know, serving your way to greatness. You know, how do you become great in the eyes of the Lord? You don't lift yourself up like through lust. You lift yourself up by humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord. You submit to God, you know, you resist the devil and you draw nigh to God. And we talked about some ways you do that, right? Like getting, getting back into God's word, prayer, church, servant, things like that. Let's continue. So now I think the next two passages, <coughs> you can see as, as this theme of exaltation, and this theme of being abased goes on through James 4. Now it talks about exalting yourself by condemnation. What does it mean by that? By condemning other people. James 4, verse 11. <coughs> Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Right? So what has that got to do with being exalted and being abased? Because sometimes people condemn others. They speak down at others to lift themselves up. Right? They make fun of others. They bully others. They make other people feel worse to make themselves feel better. That happens in Australia. They, they talk about the tall puppy syndrome. You know, cut people down so that you feel better about yourself. You know, talk about how you, know, when you don't want other people to be successful because you yourself are not trying to be and doing anything with your life. So this judging... In, in James 4.11, he's not just talking about discerning, right? Because judging can also be used, to, like the word can also be used about condemnation, right? And this is what I believe is being talked about in James 4, when you actually condemn somebody. He's saying, hey, if you speak evil of his brother, right? This is why the judging, speaking evil of them, you're speaking evil of the law, right? So he's saying in a, in, in a way, when you, the way you treat others, you're saying something about the law. This is why 
you know, sometimes in the Bible you see that when people don't live right, it says they blaspheme the word of God because the way you act and the things you do reflects badly on God, on God's law, and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, so he says here, if you're condemning the law, you're obviously not doing the law, but you're a judge. What should our conversation be like? Ephesians 4.29. I feel like I mentioned these again. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. So you see, the opposite of tearing down people to lift yourself up is your, your communication and what proceeds out of your mouth should lift people up. Right? So that's, that's how you humble yourself, is you lift others up rather than yourself up. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Look, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So that's what your speech should be like. So the judging, see, some people have this wrong idea that it's wrong to judge. That's not true. So what is it talking about in James Four. A lot of people, sometimes people use James 4 or they use Matthew 7. And James 4 is talking about condemning others, right? And being in the place of God, tearing people down rather than building them up. And then the judging in Matthew 7 is about not being a hypocrite. Right? Judge not that ye be not judged. So Matthew 7 doesn't just say judge not. It says judge not that ye be not judged. For with why? For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So he's saying here, don't be a hypocrite in the way you judge. Because if you judge people that way, hypocritically, that's how God is going to judge you, right? When it comes to your judgment. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? So you see how it's being a hypocrite? Or wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, while the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. See, so that's what's being condemned in Matthew 7. It's not judging and being discerning, right, and condemning things rightfully. James 4 is about condemning things wrongfully. Matthew 7 is about being a hypocrite. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then does it say just leave the moat in your brother's eye? No. Then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So you see how this passage is not talking about not judging, you have to judge because you have to know that there's a moat in your brother's eye. But it's saying, hey, don't be hypocritical. If you've got a beam in your eye, remove that first before you remove the moat out of your brother's eye. Jesus says here, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You remember how we, we deal, dealt with that in James chapter 2? Remember about being partial in yourselves and judging outwardly rather than inwardly. See, so again, this is Jesus saying here, hey, the right way to judge is not to a judge according to the outward appearance, how do you judge righteous judgment according to the inward man? Philippians 1, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more, look at this, in knowledge and in all judgment. All right? So you've got to grow in judgment, grow in discernment the right way. James 4.12, let's move on. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? So you see how this theme again is going back to exalting yourself why because it's like saying when you condemn your brother what are you putting yourself in the place of god you know like lucifer wanted to be he wanted to be like the most high hey there's one lawgiver that's not you that's what he's saying who's able to save and to destroy who art thou that judgest another why are you putting yourself in the place of god romans 12 19 dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay, saith the Lord. You see how it's God's place to condemn? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, <coughs> thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Right? So you don't want to exalt yourself by, you know, condemning others. Right? You want to exalt yourself just through violence and lust. Right? In the last section, now you put that sort of into the context, James, what? It's exalting yourself by boasting. Exalting yourself by boasting, talking yourself up. James will go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. So what is he talking to you now? He's saying like, hey, you guys that are boasting about all the things you're going to do, how great you are. 
You know, he's saying this is not how you should exalt yourself. You shouldn't lift yourself up by boasting about all the things you may or may not do in the future. Right? Luke 18. Let's go to the other parable where lifting up, exalting. So what I found interesting is that these two parables that I gave you, the chief rooms, and now we're going to go to the publican and the Pharisee, kind of lines up with the same three, three themes that we see in James. The lusts, which is the chief rooms and having physically stuff. And then we have the condemning others and then boasting. And I think we see these two in this parable. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. See that? Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. So he's not praying to God, he's just boasting. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, as, as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. You see how it's the same sort of theme as in James 4. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. He's lifting himself up all the things he's do, doing, like in James 4. Go to now, ye that say today, we'll go into such a city, buy and sell and get gain. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. Right? You see, you do, your, you do God's job, God's going to do your job. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Right? So we don't exalt ourselves through boasting. Verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. All right, so why boast about what you're going to do when you don't even know how long you're going to live and how long is life or in the grand scheme of things, it's really a vapour. Psalm 90 verse 10 says, The days of our years are three score years and ten. If by reason of strength they be four score years. So that's 70 or 80 years. Yet is there strength, labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away right so life is so short guys you know don't waste your life you know even as i start getting i was talking about elizabeth, elizabeth last night because just reflecting on this passage and like life is so short i mean i, I mean i mean i'm 36 i'm still young i guess in the grand scheme of things but i mean we're already like halfway through life you know that's why people go through their midlife crisis right why because you realize gosh like life is so short half my life is over what have i done with my life you know and life really is short you know, let's say you have 70, 80 years, you know, I know Lewis used to always say, you know, you have 80, 80 Christmases. Gosh, when you put it in that perspective, you know, and half, and half of them already gone, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a minuscule amount of time. So, you know, that's why don't waste your life, you know, you know step out of the boat, you know, go for it sometimes in life. You know, make sure you're serving God because before you know it, your life is over and you haven't invested anything in eternity, right? You haven't served God. You lifted yourself up the wrong way through lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, rather than humbling yourselves, submitting yourself, doing great things for God, and then God will lift you up at judgment. James 4, 15. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall do this or that, right? So verse 15 is about, you know, remembering that the source is always God, Right? Deuteronomy 8.10, I wanted to read this passage to you because even though it's an Old Testament passage, I think it's very relevant today that, you know, when you think about how blessed you are, that you don't forget that it comes from God. Deuteronomy 8.10, he's talking about the Israelites when they're in and they're being prosperous in the land that God has given them. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which, which he hath given thee. Beware. So what he's saying here, he's like, take heed, be, be, be wary that you don't do this, that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day, lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, right, your business is booming, is going well, your career is going well, you built yourself a house, got plenty of food to eat, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, your bank account's looking healthy, and all that thou hast is multiplied. Look verse 14. Then thine heart be lifted up, 
and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You forget the Lord that saved you from hell. That's, that's the application in the New Testament. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of the flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee, to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand had gotten me this well. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Right? So it's a great verse to reflect on. Hey, don't forget you know, where your things come from. Don't forget who the source of all your prosperity is. And don't forget God in your prosperity. John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. All right, so don't forget who the source is. It's always God. Without me, ye can do nothing. Verse 16, but now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil, right? So we go back to the heading of this section, exalting yourself through boasting. That's the wrong way to lift yourself up. And he's saying here that is wrong. All such rejoicing is evil. Proverbs 27, 1, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So you can see how James, I believe, is kind of alluding to this passage. Because when he says, why are you boasting of all the things you're going to do? I mean, life is so short, you don't even know how long you're going to live. It's but a vapor. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. So you see, you don't focus on exalting yourself, you just focus on doing what's right, and if you're doing what's right, others will exalt you. God will exalt you. Okay, and the last verse, James 4 verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So it's almost like it's almost like he's given a chapter where he's saying, don't exalt yourself. Here are wrong ways to exalt yourself through the lusts, through condemnation, through boasting. The right thing to do is humble yourself. And then he ends with this. Now you know what's right to do. If you don't do it, you're in sin. <laughs> so, so you see here, and the great thing about this passage is like sometimes we think not doing bad things is enough. You know, when people think, oh, I'm a, I'm a good person. I don't, and then this is how they say, sometimes they say, I don't murder, I don't steal. It's all the things they don't do, right? But what does this verse say? This verse is saying, if you know to do something good and you don't do it, that's a sin. So you see how it's not just enough, God's standard, it's not just enough to be not doing bad things. If you know what is good and you're not doing it, that's a sin too. Right? And that often plays into the conscience. Right? So not exalting yourself is not enough. Because you might say, well, I don't exalt myself. But then the question is, but are you humbling yourself? Are you submitting to God? You know, are you submitting to God's will? Are you drawing nigh to God to resist the devil, to flee from you? Right? And now that you know it, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him... It is sin. <laughs> All right, I hope you learned something there from James chapter 4, and the next week we'll finish off James chapter 5. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the lesson here. Pray, Lord, that you'll help us. Help us to humble ourselves so that you will lift us up. Help us not to exalt ourselves. Help us to draw nigh to you. All right, so you'll draw nigh to us, and the devil will flee from us. So, Lord, thank you for that reminder today. Help us to get our perspective right in life. And pray, Lord, that, you know, we are reminded today that life is short. It's but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. Let's use our short life to humble ourselves, submit to your will. And Lord, we know that you will lift us up in eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.